All right, everyone, we'll just wait uh, two minutes and then start. Um, there's about 40 attendees at the moment and we've had uh, over 100 registrations. So we'll just give two minutes and then start proper weekly later. Thank you. Greetings, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're about to kick start. Um, thank you, everyone, who um, for joining us today, and um, those who are attending and still joining um, by registration. Look forward to you coming on. Um, just FYI, the uh, webinar is currently being recorded and is being live streamed on Facebook. Um, and with that said, I hand over to Lydia and Kevin to kick us off. Thank you. Naka and welcome to the Negotiating a New High Seas Treaty and Why It Matters for Us in the Pacific webinar. I'm Livia Bakanasinga and I work for the Pacific Network on Globalization. My colleagues this morning will be co moderating, facilitating uh, Marioni Chung from the Development Alternatives uh, with Women for a New Era or DAWN, Kevin Chan from the High Seas Alliance. And Alfred Relief uh, from WWF Pacific, who is also on the panel. 
and we're delighted to bring you this webinar from the Pacific. Happy New Year. To decade, uh, before I go on, I'll provide a very brief, very, very brief uh, introduction to the BBNJ. We have panelists who can provide an overview and a more detailed uh, version of that. Uh, so, and then I'll go on to why it's important for us in the Pacific. So two decades ago in 2002, the UN held an informal consultative, uh, consultative process uh, discussions on the protection and the preservation of the marine environment. And from that, they reported that urgent, uh, urgent action was needed uh, to protect marine biodiversity uh, at all levels. Two years later, the United Nations General Assembly established an ad hoc uh, inform informal working group known as the BBNJ to examine issues uh, relating to the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction. We'll call that BBNJ from now on. So in 2006, the first meeting of the BBNJ ad hoc uh, uh, informal working group met to discuss all issues uh, relating and to address the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. With the first intergovernmental conference um, officially commencing in 2018. So it's been a long road, but it also shows different interests, the varying interests between states, um, regions, blocks uh, within the negotiations of the BBNJ. And why does it matter for us in the Pacific? Well, the Pacific Ocean is our shared identity and responsibility. We are of the ocean, connected through its currents from before there were nations. Uh, intimately understanding the many interrelated systems. The obligation of safeguarding the ocean uh, by Pacific peoples continues to this day with threats from harmful fishing practices, uh, dumping of nuclear waste and insufficient protection of marine areas only to name a few. Uh, we Pacific Islanders are on the front lines of the new frontier mentality to ocean exploitations and the accompanying challenges that will impact our ocean. Uh, most of these challenges are not just happening within our exclusive economic zones, but beyond in the vast open space where there is no single uh, state authority and where there is no coordinated global uh, framework to protect and conserve the marine environment. And so how do we as Pacific Islanders, as representatives of civil society organizations, non-state actors, and so on, ensure that the vast open space, uh, ocean space, is protected to safeguard our islands, peoples, and the planet overall? How do we fulfill our obligations to the ocean in the face of these contemporary um, threats? And that's why the development of alternatives with women in a new era, the WWF Pacific, the High Seas Alliance, and the Pacific Network on Globalization and to keep our discussions uh, amongst us as Pacific Islanders to find a way to contribute to the BBNJ uh, negotiations. And along with that, we've got a wonderful lineup of panelists uh, who are involved in the BBNJ process. You can ask them all the questions you have on the BBNJ, and they will provide you all of that information. And with that, I'll hand over to Kevin, who will say a few words. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Chand. I'm an international lawyer from Fiji, currently based in New York, where I work with the High Seas Alliance. The High Seas Alliance is a coalition of NGOs that work together with one voice on BBNJ. And being from the Pacific, I work closely with the PCIDs in New York, um, but also I see real value in engaging NGOs and CSOs in the Pacific because you're also active in, on multiple fronts, uh, human rights, climate change, indigenous rights, traditional knowledge, a whole host of things that are so important to what the Pacific is comprised of and what we care about. And in that line, I've been having conversations with Mariani, Live, Alfred, Maureen over the past few months, thinking about ways to engage civil society organizations, much like the work I do with the High Seas Alliance, where we work as a coordinated group of NGOs. Um, there's so much value in leverage, leveraging the knowledge and the expertise the Pacific has. And we're thinking this is a start of longer conversations we might have on this front. And this is going to be the first of many webinars that focus on BBNJ. This is more an entry point, but I think we're going to touch on uh, deeper explorations of subtopics that are of interest to the CSO community in the Pacific. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Marioni. She's going to take the lead. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, 
Thank you, Kevin and Lizanne. So we'll jump straight into presentations um, from, and hear from our speakers. Um, our first speaker is uh, Clement Mulalap. He's hailing from uh, the island of Wap, Wap in the FSM. He is an international law consultant who specializes in international environmental law, particularly climate change law and biodiversity conservation law, the law of the sea, uh, and international indigenous law, with several articles and chapters published on those matters. Among other responsibilities, Clement is currently the legal advisor for the permanent mission uh, of the Federated States of Micronesia to the United Nations, and has represented the Federated States of Micronesia in various multilateral fora, including meetings of the UNFCCC and CBD, the development of the mining code of back for the ISA and negotiations for the BBNJ instrument. Clement, uh, greetings and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a bit about um, the BBNJ and how the Pacific is currently engaged? Um, over to you, Clement. Well, thank you very much, Marioni, and respectful greetings to colleagues, to participants, to the attendees. I, I do have a bit of a PowerPoint presentation to, to share with everyone. So if you give me a few seconds, I will try to share that, share my screen right now. Great. Or I assume that you can see my screen right now. So for this, to start us off, I, I have a number of slides giving a bit of an overview of the discussion so far, the process so far to negotiate a, the BBNJ instrument, as well as a couple of slides on the current major priorities for the Pacific SIDS. I think I might have to speed through a few of them given the time constraints. Uh, so if you want to screenshot or take, uh, take, some, uh, take pictures of the screen as I go through, you might have to do that, but I'll be happy to share my slides later on as well. Uh, but also I'm grateful to Liva who's, who started us off because she kind of touched on a number of the points that I wanted to raise anyway. Uh, just to, to begin for everyone's uh, information, the BBNJ instrument, in case you're not aware, it is, it is envisioned to be an international legally binding instrument under the Law of the Sea Convention that will focus on the conservation and sustainable use of marine life of areas beyond national jurisdiction and we short change it to BBNJ instrument. And when we talk about areas beyond national jurisdiction, the two main components of ABNJ are the high seas, uh, the water column in the high seas, as you can see in this really sort of uh, complicated graph, uh, uh, graphic, as well as the deep seabed, ocean floor, and subsoil, um, also sometimes called the area, which is underneath the high seas water column. And those are the two main components that are being addressed in the current BBNJ negotiations. And just a little bit kind of drilling down into areas beyond national jurisdiction, two thirds of the global ocean is ABNJ and about half of the total biological productivity of the ocean occurs in the BBNJ. Uh, BBNJ or ABNJ is a major regulator of the climate system with about half a billion tons of carbon dioxide sequestered annually in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Nearly three, four, th nearly three fourths of the global fish harvest uh, uh, involves fish that range between exclusive economic zones and the high seas. Uh, there's ongoing work and interest in so-called genetic resources of marine life in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And there are also marine creatures such as whales, sea turtles, salmon, and sharks that range between exclusive economic zones and the high seas that are of cultural and historical significance for communities such as those in the Pacific. At the same time, you have significant major burdens on the ocean, uh, which I'm sure we are aware of in terms of marine debris and pollution, but also overfishing and climate change related impacts such as ocean warming, acidification, deoxygenation, and noise pollution as well. And so you have all these different uh, services that ABNJ and BBNJ provide, as well as all these different burdens on ABNJ and BBNJ. And so the question arises, uh, how do you regulate and how do you manage the ocean to address all these different services and pressures? And unfortunately, in international law, there are multiple sort of frameworks that try to address this in, in fragmented ways. You do have the Law of the Sea Convention, which includes the Part 11 Agreement and the Fish Stocks Agreement, but you also have a number of biodiversity instruments, you have fisheries instruments, you have pollution-related instruments under the IMO, et cetera, and then you have a number of regional and sub-regional uh, 
fisheries management organizations and regional seas organizations, and you have customary international law that's kind of glommed onto that sort of framework and you have different approaches. Uh, this is one, one uh, chart that I've used in the past to show just how complicated the, the, the current international marine use and governance framework is with all these different actors and entities having some say in what goes on in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so it, it, with that in mind, uh, as Alivia mentioned earlier at the beginning of the, the, the webinar, the international community has been undergoing a nearly two decade process to address what needs to be done with respect to BBNJ. And in 2011, uh, an important meeting took place in the process in the ad hoc working group, open-ended working group in the process that among other things, identified a package, a so-called package of issues that must be considered uh, when discussing a multilateral agreement under the Law of the Sea Convention. And that package of issues uh, deal with marine genetic resources, area-based management tools, environmental impact assessments, and capacity building and transfer of marine technology. Uh, uh, and in that process, it was also identified by most participants that there are significant legal and implementation gaps for A, B, and J that should be addressed by this future framework. We've talked a little bit about the fragmentation of the existing legal frameworks with no single overarching framework that will uh, work towards cooperation, coherence, and consistency. There's no consolidation of key principles such as precaution and polluter pays. Uh, in terms of marine protected areas and similar tools, there's no global framework for establishing these sort of networks. Instead, you have multiple approaches such as uh, PSSAs under the IMO, APEIs under the International Seabed Authority, uh, different measures taken by uh, fisheries management organizations. You also have the cutting edge issue of marine genetic resources. Are they a common territory of mankind? What are the rules, if any, that should govern access and benefits for them? There's also concern that there is no sort of global set of standards or rules for environmental impact assessments that impact areas beyond national jurisdiction. Instead, there's a lot of reliance on sort of national approaches as well as these different segmented sectoral approaches across the board. And finally, uh, but also important, there are provisions existing in the Law of the Sea Convention on capacity building and transfer of marine technology that have not been properly operationalized, especially for ABNJ, and they need to be operationalized. Uh, for the next few slides, and this is where I'm going to have to zip through because of the time constraints, but this is just showing the sort of process that, uh, that launched the, the, the current intergovernmental conference to negotiate the BBNJ instrument, uh, starting with the adoption of a, an important resolution for the PREPCOM in January 2015 here, and then the holding of the PREPCOM, which is supposed to precede the intergovernmental conference. The PREPCOM was held in uh, over two sessions, uh, over a number of sessions, uh, starting in July 2017, that ended up with very incomplete conclusions, uh, actually a lack of consensus on what needs to be reflected in the BBNJ instrument, but it definitely showed significant international interest in the process and helped push forward to the launching of the intergovernmental conference, the actual intergovernmental conference to, to negotiate the BBNJ instrument. Um, and as you see here, the original resolution for the Intergovernmental Conference envisioned four substantive sessions of the Intergovernmental Conference. The first one was in September of 2018. And you see some images there and the initial work done on the BBNJ instrument. The second substantive session was in March to April of 2019, kind of with the use of uh, kind of drilling down into a number of sets of options that were produced after the first session. And then in the third substantive session of the Intergovernmental Conference in August of 2019, the conference had before it a sort of zero draft of text that was produced by the president of the conference and that uh, helped sort of streamline the different options on, on the table, uh, but also underscoring just how much work remained to be done. The, the fourth intergovernmental session, uh, the session of the fourth substantive session of the conference was supposed to be held in March of 2022 or 2020. But of course, as we know, COVID happened. And so the fourth substantive session has been postponed to March 2022. So keep your fingers crossed that that'll actually happen. But in the meantime, over the last couple of years, there have been a number of multiple sort of online dialogues and and discussions that have tried to keep the momentum going in this process, including through the High Seas Treaty Dialogues and various publications from, from the private sector, from civil society, scientists, experts, et cetera. But of course, it's very important that we actually 
you know, meet in person and kind of hash out everything. And so just to conclude, just two more slides here, just underscoring the importance of the BVNJ process to the Pacific. Uh, this uh, uh, map should be very familiar to you, the wide expanse of the Pacific Oceanscape, but also noting there are a number of areas beyond national jurisdiction pockets or ABNJ pockets um, throughout the Pacific Oceanscape and of course the Pacific Ocean as a whole surrounding our, our island territories. And so in the BBNJ negotiations, these are a number of sort of major priorities that the Pacific states have tried to carry across in the negotiations, uh, dealing with the protection and restoration of the marine environment of ABNJ, including through ABMPs and EIAs, um, uh, ensuring proper cooperation and coordination between all the different uh, BVNJ related sectors that we discuss without undermining their effectiveness, the importance of addressing the common heritage of mankind in connection with marine genetic resources, making sure that there is effective and meaningful capacity building and transfer of marine technology through this process, um, highlighting the importance of equity, both intra and intergenerational equity, uh, the special case of SIDS, which is an important issue that we've carried over from the climate change space, for example, into the ocean space. Um, the notion of adjacency, the importance of making sure that the interests of coastal states that are adjacent to areas by national jurisdiction are properly taken into consideration. We talked about stewardship, which really ties into sort of the cultural connections that the Pacific has with our ocean spaces and the stewardship uh, charge that we have for it. And of course, the importance of making sure that any decisions made under the BBNJ instrument, we based on both the best available scientific information and the relevant traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities, which is definitely uh, prevalent within the Pacific, but also in other parts of the world. I'm really sorry for kind of zooming through this, uh, but again, I'd be happy to share my slides later on to those who are interested, as well as take questions later on today. And I think that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the pictures as well. I tried to put as many Pacific people in them as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clement, for that presentation um, and making your slides available. Um, you've got two more minutes and I, I really wish to um, just ask a follow-up question that maybe you could speak to um, since you've highlighted the procedural aspects of it, the timeline, as well as the BCID's priorities. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share um, what kinds of opportunities um, exist for Pacific civil society organizations to engage um, PCIDS um, in New York and contribute to uh, the BBNJ process in your, in your view? Yeah, I, uh, thanks for that question. I think, I, uh, I don't want to maybe speak too much out of, uh, out of station, so to speak, although I will say that a representative of the chair of the PSIDS is here with us as one of the participants. But I think the, the Pacific SIDS group in New York is generally open to receiving inputs from, from non-states parties, for example, from non-states organizations, um, whether directly or you can go through the Pacific Ocean Alliance, for example, which is a pretty extensive alliance in the, in the Pacific of different actors that try to feed in uh, uh, inputs to the Pacific Islands Forum uh, and Pacific SIDS, etc. So there are opportunities there. Um, I also think it would be nice for our group, the Pacific SIDS, to have sort of a regular, maybe once or twice a year, um, in, uh, webinars of this sort that can invite uh, participants, uh, like from civil society organizations, to to make presentations. And of course, you should uh, feel you should try as much as you can. To engage directly with your national governments at the at the local domestic levels, to try to get them to be uh, more open about their participation in the BBNJ process and to be more receptive to your views, so that they can ultimately be fed into the negotiations. And lastly, if you have the ability to actually participate directly in the negotiations as an accredited entity, you can uh, explore that possibility and uh, uh, register to be credentialed to participate in the negotiations. Um, the, uh, as well as in the sort of intercessional discussions that are being uh, undertaken under um, under the auspices of the president of the conference, as well as by uh, related parties like the, the the High Seas Treaty Dialogues. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate that. Um, we'll move now to our second speaker. Um, our second speaker uh, today is uh, Duncan Curry. Uh, Duncan has practiced international environmental law for 30 years, um, including working with or on radioactive nuclear transports through the Pacific, bottom trolling, and currently on deep sea mining. 
He advises the High Seas Alliance on international law and policy and has attended all the BBNJ meetings since 2008. And he also advises the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition on seabed mining and bottom flooring. Uh, Duncan joins us from Aotearoa. Uh, greetings, Duncan. Um, he'll be presenting today on the Fukushima nuclear discharge incident and opportunities under the BBNJ agreement to uh, transparently harm. Duncan, and thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Vanaka, Mirioni, and uh, Kiora Tatu from Atira, Kiorana, Ula, Malo, Talofa. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, affect the BBNJ negotiations. Um, in the future, using the Fukushima example. Uh, current assessments, which is really where uh, the, the issue um, becomes relevant. Six of the Law of the Sea Convention, which requires that when states have reasonable grounds for believing that planned activity I'm sorry, Duncan, um, you were not able to, sorry, Duncan, to um, in interrupt. Duncan, are you able to hear us? I think we've lost you. Let's give uh, Duncan a moment to, um, we all have internet glitches. Duncan, are you able uh, to hear Sorry, us? Mary, uh, Hi, Duncan. Sorry, we missed. Um, uh, yeah, no, sorry. That, uh, you can either. Are you able to authorize my video? Yep. We'll get. Um, You're welcome to put someone else on while we sort out my connection, if you like. Um, we can. Uh, in terms of your slides, Kev is, if Kevin has a copy, he can share the, his screen. Um, uh, yes, happy to share. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, Duncan, and if you're okay to start uh, without the video, um, your connection sounds Absolutely great. perfect. Thank you, Kevin, and apologies for the technical glitch. So yeah, if you go to the next slide, please, Kevin, thank you. Yeah, I'm just noting here, Article 206 of UNCLOS provides the legal framework for environmental impact assessments that uh, when states have reasonable grounds for believing that planned activities under their jurisdiction or control may cause substantial pollution of or significant and harmful changes to the marine environment, they shall conduct an EIA. But that's the theory. The practice is there are no uniform impact assessment requirements. There's no consistent application of environmental impact assessments, uh, including minimum standards, as, um, as Clement said, no cumulative impact assessments, no integrated management across sectors, uh, no central scientific review, and no requirements for consultation. So the, the next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. And um, some of the key issues in the BBNJ process, and some of the live issues which have yet to be settled, are uh, the threshold. What is the threshold? Is it the same threshold as in Article 206? Or is it um, a modified threshold, which has a lot of support based on the Madrid Protocol, but uh, in that do are effects more, more than minor or transitory? Uh, another issue, which I'm going to emphasise a little bit more, because it's relevant to Fukushima, is effects on is whether the EIAs are required for activities which have an effect on areas beyond national jurisdiction, or only activities actually in, in the area beyond national jurisdiction. That's a really important issue. Whether there's a review of environmental impact assessments to deter substandard or deficient EIAs is, is a major issue. Um, and because you know, these reviews are required if 
an EIA is not undertaken in the way it's meant to be undertaken. Who makes the final decision? Is it the state or the conference of the parties that makes a decision? And again, if, there's a, if it is a state, is there some sort of backstop or some sort of review that can take place if necessary? And what's the decision um, making standard or the objective of the EIA decision making? And just two other issues is, what are the status of environmental impact assessments undertaken or not undertaken by regional and sectoral bodies such as fisheries organizations? And is there any scope for any review of those? And what is the role of strategic environmental assessments? So thank you. And the next slide, please, Kevin. And uh, yeah, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the crucial issue is who does make the decision whether an activity can go ahead? Is it the state or is it the, um, the conference of the parties or the scientific body under the conference of the parties of the BBNJ agreement? And one of the important issues here is a, an important proposal for what we call tiering. In other words, the state determines whether the activity is likely to have a more than minor or transitory effect and thus require an environmental impact assessment. And if it does, then that could be subject to review by the scientific and technical body. If not, it can go ahead under the state's purview. And then who would prepare the EA? Is it the state or is it the um, Congress of the Parties or, or the scientific and technical body? Thank you. The next slide, please. And why does this matter for the Pacific? Well, for the, the important reason, the Pacific Ocean is obviously a, a huge ocean. It's a likely testing ground for various projects, especially new projects such as, for example, um, we, we, can, we can imagine um, geoengineering proposals, for example, or other similar large scale proposals, which are called, we call new and emerging activities, which may have adverse effects on the Pacific. There is really a power imbalance. Uh, if there's no involvement of the um, conference of the parties or the scientific technical body, then there may be forum shopping and little recourse uh, to buy Pacific Island states if there's a problem. And then one really good example, which I'll turn to now is Fukushima. Next slide, please, uh, Kevin. And then for those of you to, who need a reminder, in the March 2011 uh, accident as a result of the, the uh, earthquake and tsunami, um, there's been an accumulation of radioactive nuclear waste and Japan is proposing to release over a million tons of radioactive waste, waste from its storage tanks, which is a combination of recovered groundwater and cooling waters, which became injected. And there are a number of radionuclides in it. It, is, it will undergo a testing, a, a, what's called an ALTS um, project, uh, process, whereby the radionuclides are removed, but there's no intention to remove, for example, tritium, an important radionuclide, and others such as strontium-90, carbon-14, and others may well be in there as well, because we just don't know what, are the, what will be the outcome of the ALPS process. Uh, thank you. The next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. And here is a relatively recent paper by Zhao et al. showing how the radioactive waste may disperse throughout the Pacific after the discharge using two different models. But as you can see here, particularly in the bottom, that five, ten years later, the modeling shows there will be a significant dispersal of the radioactive pollution, particularly through the Northern Pacific. Thank you for the, the next slide, please. And on the other hand, Japan has conducted recently what they call a radiological assessment. Um, it was not a full environmental impact assessment. I want to emphasize that it was a very limited assessment produced by the, the nuclear um, in, in, industry, TEPCO. It was not a full assessment of the potential effects of the discharge. It really focused on what happened about 10K outside the pipeline instead of what will happen on the ocean as a whole. Um, no system, no systematic assessment of effects on ecosystems or cumulative effects over the 30 year discharge and effects of the, that on the marine environment. Um, and no cumulative impacts, of course, there are already some radioactive contamination from the accident itself. And so what could be the cumulative impact there? And, uh, and most importantly, what are the alternatives to the discharge? Because one of the important aspects of and a good EIA is a proposal of what alternatives there may be. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> and very brief overview of international law. 
uh, the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. We all know about that. But really, what also importantly is the, the need to prohibit significant transboundary harm under Article 194, Paragraph 2, to ensure that activities are arising from incidents act or activities under the jurisdictional control do not spread from beyond the areas where they exercise sovereign rights. And that's very settled law. I'm, I'm citing a couple of cases by the International Court of Justice, uh, as well as the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which made it very clear that this uh, applies to activities with an impact on the environment beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, such as in the high seas. So the next slide, please. Um, thank you. And in the Pacific, we have a number of treaties which do apply to th these kinds of dumping of radioactive waste, the Treaty of Rarotonga, the Waitangi, Waigani Convention, rather, and the Numea Convention. Japan is not a party to this, but again, I underline that, underline that international law requires Japan to take all appropriate measures to prevent significant transboundary harm to the Pacific. The next slide, please, Kevin. And so turning to BBNJ, Article 22.3 of the current draft article provides that the requirements to conduct an EIA, and here we have square brackets, which means it's yet to be determined, either only applies to activities conducted in the area beyond national jurisdiction, or applies to all activities which have an impact in areas beyond national jurisdiction, or an effect in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So if the first alternative, the uh, act, what's called the activities basis was applied, then Fukushima would not be caught because it only applies to activities conducted in ABNJ. But um, if it's an effects-based um, criterion, then it would be. But I would also emphasize that in either case, the BBNJ process requirements would have weight. And what BBNJ will bring to the table, and Clement touched on this, are issues such as consultation, I think probably most importantly for the Pacific, as well as specifics on screening, how activities are to be screened, how the EI is to be undertaken, what monitoring is to be undertaken, um, how the report is to be prepared. And the specific provision, which is in the current text, is how traditional knowledge is to be taken into account and what global minimum standards will be applied. And so, yeah, emphasizing traditional knowledge, consultation, including with the public and including with coastal states and indigenous and local communities. And the next slide, please. And yeah, so that, that's it. So yeah, if we have any more time, I'm happy to answer any questions or we'll talk about this later on. So thank you, Marianne and everybody. Thank you very much, Duncan, uh, for that presentation. I'm sure there will be questions. So, um... We'll, we'll take any questions to Duncan's uh, presentation in the Q&A um, session. But thank you, Duncan. You know, that statement you made at the beginning about the Pacific um, is a testing ground for projects that landed, um, you know, right in our, my core. And I know that many Pacific Islanders who work um, to protect um, our oceans and advocate for, um, yeah, that we are consulted and that we stop becoming these experimental projects um, are concerned and hope that something like a BBNJ would address um, the effects of um, these projects, including the, the Fukushima um, wastewater um, yeah, dumping in the Pacific. With that said, um, I'll move to the third speaker. Um, our third speaker is... Uh, Dr. Katie Saraki. Welcome, Dr. Katie. Um, Dr. Katie is from the island of Rendova in the Solomon Islands and is one of our Pacific women trailblazing STEM in the region for us. Uh, Dr. Katie is currently the coordinator for the Pacific Community Center for Ocean Science at the Pacific Community. Uh, she completed her bachelor's at uh, USP like many of us, and she holds a, a master's from the University of Sydney and a PhD from the University of East Anglia in the UK. Uh, she was formerly the manager of the Pacific Natural Products Research Centre at USP, and uh, Dr. Katie um, has been supporting Pacific Island countries on the marine genetic resources component within the BBNJ negotiations. 
Uh, greetings, Dr. Katie. Can you tell us a bit about MGRs, Marine Genetic Resources, uh, building science capacity in the Pacific uh, within the BBNJ? Avinaka uh, <clears throat> Marioni and uh, Bula, everybody. Uh, greetings from Suva. Thank you so much for that uh, very kind and generous introduction, uh, Marioni. Um, <clears throat> I think from the, the outset, I'd like to make clear that I'm, I'm no lawyer uh, and uh, I'm not a marine biologist. I come to this space as a marine chemist who works within marine natural products. Um, Kevin, do you have my slides? Can you? Uh, yep, let me share it. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, okay, can you put it on slideshow? Please. Does that work? Yes, yes. Thank you. So, um, I just have three key points I will talk about because marine genetic resources uh, and capacity building, these are two separate topics under BBNJ as well, and they're quite broad, quite big. Uh, and so I'm combining them. <clears throat> the first key message uh, or um, key message is that we need, um, you know, better scientific knowledge uh, is needed uh, for us to sustainably manage for us to protect and um, to care for our, 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 you know, our deep ocean. And part of the reason is because you know, within this deep ocean spaces, there's very little scientific knowledge available to us. And so we do not know what's there and we cannot care for what we do not know. And we cannot conserve what we do not know. And so <clears throat> better scientific knowledge of this poorly studied and poorly um, um, uh, known spaces and the biodiversity in it is very important. The second point I would uh, like to uh, talk about briefly is that um, broader understanding of capacity and capacity needs uh, are needed. And this needs to be expanded beyond the technology and and the um, a normal science space, you know, without, um, we, we need um, capacity also in governance structures, uh, legislative bodies. Without capacity in those areas, it is very hard also for us to actually apply, implement the policy as well as build the science capacity. We may have the science capacity, but if we do not have the legislative capacity, then you know, we cannot implement these big agreements and, and um, uh, instruments, particularly uh, in BBNJ as well. And the final point I will just touch on very briefly is you know, BBNJ, this agreement provides us an opportunity for us to determine uh, how we should shape partnerships, how we can empower our Pacific uh, scientists to determine how they want to collaborate with external uh, scientists as well. Next slide, please. So I'll just start off uh, with uh, what is meant by MGRs. This is a very technical area. So what I've just done is, you know, looking at what uh, what is generally meant by NGRs and, you know, equating it to the biodiversity. So our ocean is full of biologically and genetically diverse marine life, you know, from the surface of the ocean all the way down the water column, uh, down at, in the sea at the seabed. You will find all forms of different um, uh, marine life. 
and they all have marine uh, genetic material, which makes them part of the marine biodiversity. But when we're talking about marine genetic resources, we are referring mostly to those uh, marine genetic resources that have potential value. You know, this could be ecological, it could be economical, it could be cultural. Um, and, and, and so that's what we meant by um, the uh, marine genetic resources. Next slide, please. And so on my first point, um, oftentimes when we are talking about marine genetic resources, the discussion becomes about pharmaceuticals and biodiscovery, cosmetics, food products. But marine genetic resources it's, and, and the research around that, it's, it's more than the pharmaceutical industry and the biodiscovery. We use this type of research to identify you know, and monitor invasive species, for example, fisheries management, IUU, forensic science and wildlife, including even biological assessments of species diversity, distribution and connectivity. So having you know, that scientific knowledge and a good understanding of the marine genetic resources or the biodiversity that we have is very important. And we need access to the tools and technology uh, that can help us sustainably protect and uh, use this um, ocean resources that we have. Next slide, please. Um, so on the next point, I just wanted to highlight you know, capacity and capacity needs. One of the discussions we've been having in the BBNJ is how do we, you know, identify the capacity within uh, uh, seeds or even pea seeds, you know. I mean, we all know the capacity needs we have. And I just got uh, listed a few there. Uh, we need, you know, the, the human capacity, the, uh, we need training, how do we retain the people we train? How do we sustain them and keep them going, uh, doing the work that uh, we have trained them to do? We need the technology and scientific uh, uh, knowledge, the equipment as well, access to research equipment, personnel who can actually operate and look after this equipment as required, institutional uh, capacity, we need people who can lead research you know, organizations, partnerships and uh, networks as well that can facilitate this cooperation. And as I've mentioned earlier, legislative capacity, often when we are talking about capacity, we forget about this very, very important uh, area that we also need real capacity in. In some of the, my experiences working within the Nagoya Protocol and genetic resources, this has been one of the areas that we have a real need in terms of how can we um, uh, apply the Nagoya Protocol and implement it properly. And one of the areas is, apart from, of course, the scientific uh, capacity that we need, one of those areas is the legislative capacity that we need for developing all the policies and, and the decision making around um, marine genetic resources. We need access to data and, 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 and enabling environment. A lot of times we are talking about, um, uh, in, of course, in, in this uh, BBNJ discussion, it's more to do with the uh, you know, area beyond national jurisdiction, but a lot of the research that can really help uh, our, uh, and help us identify what kind of needs that we have is you know, working within the EZ, within our own national jurisdiction and doing the research that's needed, particularly around NGRs. Uh, next slide, please. So um, on my third point, uh, this is, uh, I mean, how can we use the BBNJ to build capacity in the Pacific? I've identified some of the main needs that we have. Of course, we have many more than that. It's not really an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to link it back to benefit sharing because 
Uh, marine genetic resources, uh, the discussion around is very much linked to benefit sharing. And uh, I wanted to highlight the fact that capacity building is a form of benefit sharing. And a lot of times we overlook this as a benefit that we do get when we uh, um, uh, participate in all the research work. And you know the overarching element of, uh, I mean, aim of this treaty is to conserve and uh, um, sustainably use the biodiversity. And building our capacity is one way we can actually uh, do this. Uh, it's also often, uh, I mean, the discussions at the, in, within PSEED is also to look at a needs assessment. As we all know, we, um, one size doesn't fit all. You know, we all have, we, we do have common challenges and we do have, you know, common areas that we can work, but each country is also at different levels of, of working to, to um, um, you know, be able to implement, uh, you know, such an, in, uh, such an instrument as this. And so linking it to say perhaps uh, MGRs uh, and access and benefit sharing, having this needs assessment being linked to, to um, MGRs so that it can be funded is one way we can also uh, build capacity. Uh, one of the, the final thing I really wanted to highlight also is partnerships. Uh, my, in my experience, this is something we have benefited from as well. Uh, when we talk about M A, you know, areas beyond national jurisdiction, it's really often feel like, oh, it's too far out of reach. But, you know, a lot of the research we can do within um, our own national jurisdictions uh, contributes towards this um, um, capacity building. And we want, uh, I think we should really work towards having and, and ensuring that we have genuine partnerships that we can actually benefit from and not, you know, parachute scientists that come in, you know, with a one of workshop training us on MGRs, giving us fancy equipment and then disappearing. And we don't know what to do with any of those you know, the equipment or the, the one of training that's given. So long-term capacity uh, and, and sustain with uh, funding is an area that, you know, we really need to push for. And this uh, um, needs assessment can really highlight some of this. Uh, and I just also wanted to, to highlight that, you know, one of the things through these partnerships is we can really push for is an understanding, requesting our partners to ensure that they understand what is meant by Pacific context. You know, we are small island, but you know, large ocean states, but we need the capacity. And when they need to come and work with us, they need to be able to um, understand the context from which we are working. Next slide, please. I just wanted to finish off with this uh, project uh, that we did at USP um, uh, a while back. Uh, I personally, as I've said, I personally benefited from this and so many others as well benefited from this project. It ran for about 15 years at USP. Uh, and uh, I know that word bioprospecting is probably making people worry about what bioprospecting is, but you know, basically uh, that some of the highlights is that this, this um, um, project, we were able to collect information about the marine biodiversity of, of Fiji and especially, uh, and also the Solomon Islands. And it's, it's, you know, this is more a biodiversity inventory database, but because it also has information relating to the bioactivity and the, the pharmaceutical potential of each of the of the samples we collected. So it's called uh, the bioprospecting database. It's a first of its kind. Uh, we built capacity over 20 master students were uh, trained in this program. A lot of staff were trained over here, over the years. Eight of those master students went on to do their PhDs. 
Uh, and so, I mean, uh, we, we built uh, capacity around MGRs and we had libraries of samples. And I think one of the things I just want to link it to is that uh, we participated in a project by the Fiji government, uh, helping them with the um, development of the access and benefit sharing policy uh, on genetic resources. And part of, um, uh, of, of that whole engagement was us sharing all the work we were doing for them to be able to understand what is meant by marine genetic resources. And uh, obviously this ended up being a, a successful collaboration. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of the findings on the, on the left here. We had a Fijian red algae with, you know, some important compounds were isolated. And the, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, in this space, the capacity building overrides um, uh, or oh, I mean, really, really help us in understanding the marine biodiversity of the, of the environment. I think I'll stop there for now. And uh, next slide. Um, I just wanted to, you know, these are uh, the uh, teams that we've been collaborating with and uh, just thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Katie, um, for that excellent insight into NGRs. Um, but also emphasizing the importance of um, building, I mean, determining our partnerships and seeing uh, the opportunities that lay in the BBNJ as well as other mechanisms for the Pacific to determine our partnerships and emphasizing um, understanding um, and understanding of the Pacific context for our partners that come in. Um, but I particularly also uh, loved your emphasis on um, you know, science capacity needing governance and legislative capacity to get the benefits and to do the good work that needs to be done to protect the ocean. So thank you very much, Dr. Katie, for your presentation um, and sharing um, your wonderful work in this area. Um, we'll go to the next speaker because we're running about a bit out of time. So we hope the question time will, we can get to the question time sooner so that uh, we can hear from the audience. We see a lot of questions coming in already. So over to my friend Alfred from WWF. He's from uh, Rektuma and is our fourth speaker. Alfred is the Senior Policy and Government Affairs Manager at WWF Pacific. He joined uh, WWF in 2010 and had worked closely, uh, very closely with the WWF uh, network global policy team representing WWF Pacific across various multilateral environmental agreements, including the BBNJ negotiations. It's through this experience that Alfred shares a bird's eye view of how all of these uh, multilateral processes are linked and connected. Um, today, he's gonna be speaking to us um, on the role of the BBNJ in creating marine protected areas um, in the Pacific high seas and speaking also to you know, how this links to Pacific coastal communities and our priorities. Um, yeah, over to you, Alfred. Um, thank you, Marioni uh, and Bulabinaka, everyone. I'm Maori, um, uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to join the, um, the rest of the panelists to talk about um, uh, some of the issues being discussed at the BBNJ negotiations. So I hope you can see my screen now. Would you like to put it on um, the, it's still on the, the normal view. Yep. There you go. Can see it. Thank you, Alfred, go ahead. Uh, okay, so um, um, my presentation is going to be focusing more on the marine protected areas in the high seas and how uh, the BNJ uh, International Legally Binding Instrument could actually um, um, help us in creating uh, NPAs in the high seas. So um, I think uh, um, Kevin has already uh, um, uh, spoken to this um, and it's important to just to highlight to us the importance uh, of uh, the high seas pockets in the Pacific Ocean and the Pacific being um, the largest uh, ocean uh, in uh, the world. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and the connectivity between the, 
the high seas pockets uh, and the areas surrounding the Pacific Island nations um, and our coastal communities and the indigenous people and local communities um, in our island nations. Um, and I think uh, something that is quite important is to stress uh, the connectivity of the ocean. Um, um, the ocean doesn't recognize our um, EZ boundaries, uh, and most obvious is that the ocean currents which connect all the corners of the Pacific, uh, and that this connectivity between inland waters such as the rivers and streams and our coastal waters all the way right up to the high seas. Um, and if we look at this connectivity, we can think about uh, migrate, uh, the species migration, such as, for example, uh, our sea turtles, um, which actually nest on our coastal beaches. Uh, and when they hatch, um, they also um, migrate across the Pacific Oceans um, as a small um, turtle hatchlings, all the way right up to when they become, uh, become uh, mature adults. Uh, and they forage and feed amongst uh, uh, the various coral reefs uh, and ecosystems in our Pacific Island countries. And then they go back, migrate back to the, uh, their nesting, be the beaches where they hatched to, to lay their eggs. So that is one very, very good example of how the connectivity between um, our coastal um, communities and our coastal ecosystems together with uh, the high seas. Um, also very, very important to note the ocean current systems which move heat, nutrients, and biological materials and pollutants over great distances within the Pacific Ocean. And it also connects the, the depths of the high seas together with ecosystems and habitats um, on our coastal, uh, within our coastal ecosystems and right up to the uh, headwaters uh, in the highlands and the forests. So that means that when we talk about this connectivity, um, the BBNJ agreement needs to, to establish within a broader ocean connectivity, a management framework that embraces all sectoral uses and all jurisdictions uh, in order for the BBNJ um, agreement to be most effective. And this includes all of us here in the Pacific. And that is why it is important that we as uh, coastal communities, as indigenous peoples, and as, um, you know, um, uh, citizens of the Pacific Island countries to be more aware and be more informed and um, uh, work very closely with our national governments at the national level and at also at the regional and international level to contribute effectively to the BBNJ uh, process, um, you know, to ensure that we also have a bottom-up approach uh, in the process. So, um, I'm going to specifically uh, talk about um, um, marine protected areas as uh, one of the, of the area-based management tools that is being currently being dis uh, discussed. And I think um, um, we have a lot of uh, experience um, at the coast uh, level or within our EEZs in terms of uh, designation of marine protected areas. Um, MPAs is nothing new for us here in the Pacific because our forefathers have used traditional marine protected areas for thousands of years, and it is enshrined in our cultural uh, and ceremonial uh, practices. Nowadays, we have MPAs are still being used, um, you know, either as um, uh, traditional MPAs for our coastal communities, uh, but it all, they, you also have MPAs uh, that are being gazetted um, under national legislations. And then we also look at um, uh, the MPAs that uh, have been established uh, in the offshore area um, within our EEZs. And um, we have some examples of MPAs um, um, in terms of uh, the practices on how to designate it, uh, the processes to designate it, and also various management rules um, in place. So obviously there will be key differences between MPAs in our coastal waters and within ENZ as compared to MPAs that will be established in the uh, high seas. Um, and that's to do with the scale and also uh, in terms of uh, governance. So that is, um, and this is something that is quite complex. Um, so since there is no, um, the, the process of, um, of um, MPAs in the high seas are still being negotiated. I'm, um, I'm not going to make specific references to how the process is going to be done, but I might um, uh, you know, make reference, use the examples as illustrations of uh, the possible, uh, a possible scenario of how we can designate um, MPAs at the high seas um, uh, in relation to the BBNJ. Um, 
So this slide shows you that uh, at the moment, less than 4% of the ocean is uh, designated for protection. And I know that under various uh, multilateral environmental agreements, uh, there, are, has, there has been some commitments uh, by uh, head of states um, and also uh, in terms of how much we should put aside um, our ocean for protection. Um, and there is also the 30% uh, commitment by 2030, the 30 by 30. Um, that is also being discussed at um, um, the CBD, uh, the, the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Uh, and there are also pledges that has already been made, made at um, uh, the UN General Assembly and also um, other conventions such as the climate change one. Um, and I think um, uh, marine protected areas in the high seas uh, under the BBNJ agreement could actually contribute a lot towards these um, um, commitments that are being made uh, already and will add value not only to uh, to the high seas but also in terms of the connectivity uh, and making our protected areas at the coastal communities and coastal areas very very effective so um um, when we are looking at designating uh, marine protected areas in the high seas there's a lot of questions to to ask um, that needs to be considered. Um, the criteria to designate a mar a marine protected areas in the high seas, what kind of criteria do we need? Um, and um, this is something that is also currently be being uh, negotiated. What would be the purpose of um, designating marine protected areas? Um, is it for food security? Uh, the purpose, the main purpose is to restore biodiversity and ecosystems. What kind of challenges and threats are we trying to address? Uh, building resistance to stresses and so and many many other examples um, that we could think of. Um, what are the ecological representation and the connectivity of these marine protected areas? Uh, and this requires uh, for us to have a better understanding of um, um, the sea floor and also the deep seas, um, including the water column, um, so that we ensure that when we uh, designate marine protected areas, um, that it is ecologically representative and there is connectivity. We also need to understand the migrative pathways of, uh, of uh, marine, um, um, of migratory species. Um, and so, and also in terms of the fishery sector as well. So this is also quite important when we think about uh, the BBNJ agreement and uh, the enhanced cooperation that we really, really need to, to look into to ensure that um, our marine protected areas are actually effective. Um, we also need to consider the, the um, traditional knowledge, the relevant traditional knowledge that uh, we have uh, in the Pacific that could actually help uh, inform the designation of the marine protected areas and how, how is this going to be uh, used uh, in the process. Um, and so in terms of the scientific uh, information um, that we will also have need to, to feed into the, uh, to inform the process of designating marine protected areas. Um, not forgetting the governance arrangement uh, with the necessary resources uh, that is needed uh, to be able to effectively manage and implement uh, MPAs within the high seas. Um, so those are the kind of questions that we need to think about when we uh, talk about marine protected areas um, uh, in the high seas. So um, this is something that I think, you know, to help because this is the first time, uh, our first webinar for the BBNJ. And I think that uh, um, just to help uh, create, um, give you a scenario of how uh, MPAs can be um, established in the high seas. So I would look at, uh, um, say for example, we have a, a regional arrangements where the Pacific Island country as a region could actually submit a proposal to designate marine protected areas in one of the high sea pockets in the Pacific. Um, and this proposal would, uh, with a suggested management arrangement could actually go to the conference of the parties and just like, uh, other multilateral environmental agreements, there might be a conference of the party for the BBNJ uh, International Legally Binding Agreement um, instrument. And so once this proposal goes to the COP, uh, there might be a scientific body uh, that is established um, and uh, the COP might refer the proposal to the SABSTA and also invite member states um, and observers to make assessments of the proposal. Um, and that uh, once uh, there will be a time bound where you know this assessment is uh, uh, made, 
the assessment goes back to the COP where there's a decision. And if that decision is to adopt uh, the proposed uh, MPA, and then um, adoption of the MPA and management plan and reviewing effectiveness, then we move into the implementation um, um, with, um, say, for example, a designated uh, competent body is uh, designated to actually um, oversee the implementation. Then you have um, reporting and monitoring process in place. And then the, the reports and the monitoring and the lessons learned could then feed back into the review and also adaptive uh, management. So that is something that is one of the possibilities. Um, so just don't take my word for this because this is something that is currently uh, being discussed um, in terms of how um, marine protected areas can be designated in the high seas. And uh, lastly, but not least, I think it is very, very important um, and it's encouraging to see that uh, our peace seeds in New York are actually collaborating and um, coordinating and um, uh, as a regional block in the ongoing negotiations um, at the global level, but I think this needs to extend to ensure that um, um, civil society organizations and observers, private sector, as well as um, the local communities um, are providing uh, input into the process at the national level, and this continues to feed into the regional as well as the negotiations uh, happening at the global level. Uh, I think enhanced cooperation regime is very, very important in the BBNJ uh, discussions and enhanced cooperation regime is uh, important to allow alignment of the management arrangements within with the scientific understanding of the ecological connectivity of our ocean systems at every level. And as the climate has already shown a very, very complex structure of uh, the various MEAs and um, and instruments that are in place at the global level and at the regional level, um, which needs to be taken into consideration. And this is something that we that we need to see that enhanced cooperation is very, very strong across the regime, uh, the BBNJ um, instrument. And um, I think in order for to ensure that BBNJ instrument is um, effective that once it is uh, adopted, I think it needs to be signed and ratified by all states at its earliest so that the rules apply to all users and to everyone. Um, and that is um, my last slide. Um, and um, I'll be happy to contribute towards the discussions and the answers at the end of um, um, this um, um, panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Vinaka Alfred, for your presentation and giving us a, um, an insight into um, the MPAs within the BBNJ, but also connecting that um, and discussing how MPAs work with within the coastal communities and emphasizing, um, you know, understanding um, the transboundary and how our marine animals, marine resources are connected. Um, and keeping that in mind um, when we when we think about MPAs in the high seas. Um, we will go straight into uh, Q&A now. Um, if I can get uh, the panelists to put on their uh, videos. We've got lots of questions and um, just thanking everybody for posting their questions in their Q&A uh, box. Um, I can see that Duncan and Clement have uh, responded to some questions already. So if you want to see those replies, please go into the chat, uh, the Q&A box. So with that, I will be asking some of the questions that haven't received any replies. Um, and we'll st start with um, a rephrasing of the first question in that uh, Q&A box around the Fukushima discharge. So I'll, um, this one's for you, Duncan, um, and others can also contribute, uh, the other panelists. Um, how would cross-sectorial issues like the Fukushima discharge interact with fisheries and the work of RFMOs like WCPFC under the BBNJ? Yeah, very good question. Um, Thank you for that. 
when I talked a bit th about the impact of PBNJ, I talked about the, for example, the need to take into account cumulative impacts on the one hand, and also the need to address uh, the EIAs undertaken by regional and sectoral organizations. And I think both of those feed into that issue because, for example, in Fukushima right now, what's happening is that the International Atomic Energy Agency is undertaking some sort of study. I wouldn't call it an EIA, but some sort of study. But I would be very surprised if it actively took into account, for example, submissions by um, both fishing industry, fisheries organizations, fish, fish people, and so on. Um, and that is an essential part of an EIA is both the consultation and taking into account cumulative impacts and impacts on other activities and other interested, um, uh, interested well, uh, industries, peoples, um, coastal people, and so on. So I think what BBNJ would bring to the table is a much more structured way that environmental impact assessments do take into account these other activities. Now, uh, in a slightly different context, for example, if an EIA was meant to be conducted, for example, by the WCPFC, for tuna, um, or by South, South Pacific RFMO, for example, for a new fishery, then the benefit of BBNJ would be, again, the, the minimum standards and the structure of the BBNJ EIA process would, I think it is hoped, again, influence those organizations to have a much, again, a much more structured approach, a much more consultative approach, you know, take um, EIAs into account, take comments into account, and make sure that the, the end result is much more consistent with the BBNJ framework. And the reason I put it that way is you can't, BBNJ can't legally bind, for example, a separate organization such as an IRFMO, um, or, for or for that matter, the International Seabed Authority. But there have been really some quite significant problems already with environmental impact assessments carried out by the International Seabed Authority, um, including with consultation, and that was raised in the meeting we had in December um, in the ISA. And so again, it is you have to hope, if nothing else, that the BBNJ process will influence bodies such as the ISA in ensuring that these considerations are taken into account. And the same is true with CPA mining, by the way, is that um, it's essential that other activities such as fishing are taken into account, not just other CPA mining activities when you're assessing cumulative impacts, for example. And just the last thing I would say, sorry for the long answer, is that strategic environmental impact assessments also have an important part to play as well. And you know, th there is still discussions about that clause, but the important thing is that SEAs will take into account different activities, including fishing, for example, um, and uh, other activities. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan, for that reply. I have a question here for uh, Dr. Katie. Uh, Dr. Katie, talked about capacity building in her presentation. I'm, uh, the person is interested in the transfer of technology aspect. Can any of the panelists, or this is to um, any of the panelists, uh, elaborate on that? Is this something similar to Article 266 of UNCLOS? Uh, I'll hand over to Katie first to respond if any one person would like to reply after. Go ahead, Dr. Katie. Um, in terms of uh, capacity building, um, one of the one of the key discussions is, uh, as I've mentioned, um, what what do we need? Um, what do we need in order to participate? You know, what, what could be the enabling and the types of uh, capacity and marine technology that is needed? Um, and, uh, you know, could, could this all be part of some of the mutually agreed terms? Is there adequate, adequate funding for, for capacity building? Uh, and the types of cooperation that would be needed for us to be able to have access to, to the capacity. Um, perhaps in terms of the UNCLOS related uh, um, 
you know, the similarities, maybe I can pass that to, to um, either, you know, Clement maybe, as I am not, uh, I'm not really much of a um, lawyer in terms of all of that, yeah. Would any of the other panelists like to uh, respond to the question? Uh, sure, maybe I can respond briefly just to uh, basically um, echo what the questioner asked that the issue of the transfer of marine technology or the transfer of technology is an important element in the Law of the Sea Convention, including in Article 266, Paragraph 1 of the Law of the Sea Convention talks about, and other articles in the convention talk about how to engage in international cooperation for the transfer of marine technology um, in response to certain needs connected to the protection and preservation of the marine environment, as well as in connection with the exploitation of um, marine biological resources and uh, diversity. And so there are all these existing provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention that in the view of many delegations have not been fully operationalized in the time that the Law of the Sea Convention has been in place. And now that we're venturing into this, uh, this, uh, this space for BBNJ, it's, uh, it's just as important, if not more so, to be able to operationalize these provisions on transfer marine technology that'll contribute to the conservation and sustainable use of BBNJ in the appropriate ways. And there are ongoing debates over, for example, should these be mandatory transfers of technology or voluntary? Uh, should they be based on certain specified needs or be, be more open-ended? Um, and, and those are still ongoing discussions, but at least for the Pacific SIDS, we see this as an important element of the overall package that will be necessary in order to make sure that the overall package is operationalized. Thank you, Clement. And while I still have you on um, your mic, um, we'll just go to this question about what roles do the Australian and New Zealand governments play in the high seas negotiations within the Pacific? Um, as a piece of advice, if you could share um, your observations and knowledge on this. Uh, well, you know, Australia and New Zealand, and there might be actually representatives of both governments in this webinar. So if they are, hello. Uh, you know, but uh, Australia and New Zealand, they work uh, closely with the members of the Pacific Islands Forum, for example. And we try to come up with sort of broad general uh, positions that we can advance as a forum, whether speaking as a forum or through our individual sub-regional groups or national delegations. And so that's been helpful to have that sort of involvement. And, you know, but Australia and New Zealand also engage directly um, in their own sort of national capacities to advance their views. Uh, I do see a, quite a bit of overlap between the positions of Australia and New Zealand and the rest of the the Pacific, uh, but also some, uh, some, I think, important differences that we will, of course, uh, strive to address in a neighborly and collegial manner going forward. Uh, but they, both delegations have been important uh, participants in the negotiations to date. Um, we have time for two to three more questions given, uh, depending on the response from our panelists. So. I'm gonna gun for it um, and hopefully we can, um, yeah, give an adequate response given our time restraints. The first question is um, to the panelists, uh, what do you think about the excess and benefit sharing of intellectual property within the BBNJ? Um, who, um, if I can direct that at Duncan, um, would like to take a shot at it first? Or Alfred? It, anyone actually who would like to respond to the intellectual property question within the BBNJ? Any views? Well, we can come back around. If you so, like. so, so, sorry, Mary, I was just trying to find the question. Um, could, could you just read it out? And I'm happy okay. to answer. Uh, what do you think about the excess? and benefit sharing of intellectual property uh, within the BBNJ. We have questions okay. from, from Facebook as well. So. Okay, thanks. I mean, the, the, because the, I mean, access and benefit sharing is a really important aspect, obviously, and uh, it will be a critical part of the negotiations going forward. You know, there are some big questions to be answered, such as whether the, the benefit sharing will be voluntary or mandatory and whether the um, 
mon uh, the benefits to be shared will be monetary um, as well as non-monetary. And on the intellectual property specifically, um, there is a very live debate on the role of intellectual property. The, the Pacific um, SIDS have proposed an important um, suggestion whereby they suggest a provision that intellectual property law shall be reinforcing or, or not run against the, the interests of, um, of the core provisions of benefit sharing in the, in the agreement. So I think that's very, a very constructive solution. Um, and yeah, Clement may have more to add on that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, no, there's not much to add to that. Uh, I will say that as someone who is not an intellectual property lawyer who stayed far away from that area of law, uh, this is a bit of a challenge for me. Um, this issue is a particularly, is, is a sensitive one in the negotiations for a whole bunch of reasons for a number of delegations. And so the, co the conference has been kind of tiptoeing <laughs> about this issue of intellectual property, uh, but at least at a minimum, it seems there's there is language in the current draft text that talks about kind of what Duncan said about not using intellectual property law to override or to override the, the achievements of or the objectives of the BBNJ instrument. And there's also language there on mandatory disclosure of origin uh, in connection with patents that might be based on MGRs. Um, and so, uh, but even that sort of language has uh, generated some pushback. So there's uh, still quite a bit of way to go. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll pay close attention to that going forward. Okay. Thank you, Clement and Duncan. The next question is uh, for Alfred. Um, when it comes to MPAs in the high seas, how would these MPAs be monitored and activities regulated? Is this just through the BBNJ instrument or is there room for existing regional bodies to also assist in establishing uh, and monitoring MPAs? What's the likelihood of this? I think, um, um, uh, thank you for, for Salah for that question. And I think um, uh, that is a, a very, very good question to, to ponder on. Um, this is where enhanced cooperation is actually quite important um, uh, and ensure that it is actually enshrined within the BBNJ uh, regime. Um, and I think, um, um, uh, a hybrid arrangement is is also uh, uh, be will be very good in this situation here, where you have the conference of the parties as the global overarching um, uh, body of the agreement, and then you have regional arrangements. And so, um, um, as um, in terms of the regional arrangements, when you designate when when you make a proposal for. A designation of an MPA in the high seas, and this is where they um, you submit it to the conference of the party, the regional grouping. Um, I'll say, for example, the Pacific Island countries would actually make the proposal, um, and then once uh, the proposal is accepted, um, you have all the observers um, and the substa. Um, and also other state uh, parties, whether it's the coastal states or landlocked, will be given the opportunity to assess the proposal and then make further recommendations. Um, and once this is adopted at the COP, um, then you'd you know the, have the possibility of uh, of uh, establishing or designating a regional body to to um, to oversee and implement uh, the designation of marine protected areas um, within the high seas. And this is where, you know, collaboration and coordination amongst regional uh, organizations and competent uh, bodies to, to be able to, 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 to assist in uh, the monitoring of the BBNJ uh, of the MPAs within the high seas. Um, and um, then, um, um, review effectiveness and contribute towards um, adaptive management. But uh, as I said, this is my own, uh, this is how I, um, I, I think personally as to how this would, uh, this would be implemented. Uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, Pacific Island countries could actually continue to discuss to further strengthen this and, um, and um, help inform the negotiations at the, um, at the global level. Thank you, Alfred, for that response. Um, Duncan has a short hmm. reply before we go. So, very briefly, and just to follow up on Alfred's excellent answer, and I think the, the High Seas Alliance does believe it's really important that the Conference of the Parties has the ability to designate or establish the MPAs and takes that role because that's the f fundamental way that we're going to shift from the status quo right now where we 
you know, we only have a tiny percentage of the high seas being protected. And then, then um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we I have one more question from uh, from the Facebook audience um, before I hand over to Maureen, and it's uh, directed to uh, Duncan um, and also others can also respond. But this is uh, the last question for the webinar team. ISA is still negotiating the mining code. Should BBNJ set higher standards for the mining for the mining code in terms of EIAs and other mechanisms? Okay, yeah, I, I think I part, partially answered that question, Mariani, thank you for that. And in my earlier answer where I said, yes, I think it's really important that the um, standards are set by the BBNJ on all these aspects, consultation, um, the taking comments into account, um, having appropriate procedural times, sco scoping, screening, and, and, and so on, and as well as, as, for example, taking into account cumulative impacts. Um, the precise way that the BBNJ mechanism interacts with, for example, the seabed authority is really uh, resides in, in an article called Article 4, Paragraph 3 about not undermining. And what this re really says to the BBNJ agreement shall not undermine the um, other international organizations and agreements. And But what is also important to remember is that the BBNJ will also have a competence for marine biodiversity. So I think it's a two-way street, the, the not undermining and the respecting competences is a two-way street. And it's really important that we don't add further language, such as, for example, respecting competence or, or respecting mandates, so that there is a real way that the international negotiations and the framework in BBNJ can have can actually bite in regional and sectoral organizations such as the Seabed Authority. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan, for that. And that brings us to uh, the end of our Q&A time, and I take an opportunity to thank all the panelists just before um, I hand over to Maureen for a quick wrap up and a closing and final words from um, the organizers. So thank you. Oh, sorry, I have Dr. Katie with a hand up before I... Dr. Katie, do you have your hand up? Uh, <clears throat> I think there was a question on Fiji's uh, access benefit sharing policy and where to get a copy. Um, as well, so I just thought to quickly address that. So the policy, as I, as, as I know, is in draft and it should be with the Ministry of Environment as the focal point for the Nangoya protocol. So um, <clears throat> I don't know what has happened since uh, in terms of, you know, whether it is now, uh, um, you know, it's, it's already been accepted or it has been to cabinet or, but I know there's a draft policy which um, there were discussions around um, and uh, you could reach out to the Ministry of Environment to find out an update on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katie, for clarifying that. Um, Maureen, welcome joining us. Um, I hand over to you. Um, I know there's lots of questions still in chats, but um, we will continue this series of webinars, so and there may be opportunity to address this. Maureen, thank you. Over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, team. I think this is a really good first start by the wider Pacific CSOs and NGOs to organize this event. Um, Dawn, Pang, WWF Pacific, and the High Seas Alliance. Obviously, this is our first deep dive in an attempt to raise awareness on the importance of BBNJ, which has been, as, as Clement pointed out, two decades to get us to this particular point. Um, there is a clear, clear uh, recognition that the Pacific Ocean in particular is quite significant in its role. We know it's significant because of its climate regulatory function, biodiversity, high biodiversity, its economic lifeline for many of our countries, um, but also there's this understanding the fragmentation in gaps, both governance gaps um, right across uh, all of our, our panelists. Um, I think for many of us, if this is our first big deep dive, we have an appreciation of what the packages uh, and issues mean from a PCIT uh, Pacific view. And I think that's very important. 
there is strong international commitment at this point in time to address biodiversity loss. In fact, the global community is working very hard to halt and play in this. Um, I think Fukushima as a case study is very, very important. I think it gives many, many of us, particularly in the NGO CSO community, the understanding of several key things. One, understanding transboundary harm. Uh, two, if it emanates from within jurisdiction, what does it mean if that impact is felt beyond areas of new jur jurisdiction? The need for standardized EIAs across the board, um, this question around the threshold of impacts and cumulative impacts, the understanding of what that means. I think this is quite important and significant if we look at other uh, developments, particularly in deep sea mining, what does that mean? Uh, quite pertinent questions came through from the audience on that. And I think the Fukushima case study really, really does emphasize that for us here in the Pacific to understand that. I think Alfred's point that around protection and conservation is particularly important that uh, if you're looking at both from an impacts point of view, but also conservation and protection point of view, uh, the ocean does not recognize the kinds of artificial boundaries that we've set up within jurisdiction, uh, the need for connectivity issues, to, to really understand it across the board and these kinds of impacts. So I think the whole question on EIA, uh, and this is very important for CSOs, um, and here in the Pacific around consultations, both public, indigenous, uh, and as coastal states, the screening of activities, whether they take place within our jurisdiction or in areas beyond jurisdiction, EIAs and monitoring what happens, uh, how do we bring in traditional knowledge, and certainly global, how do we set global and agree on global minimum standards. So I think those are very, very important issues. Uh, Dr. Katie Swape brought in um, and expanded our understanding about capacity building, that this shouldn't just be restricted to science, scientific technology and equipment. Uh, it should certainly extend and enhance institutions, in particular our government's institutions, the need to practice and they have experiences within our EEZs. Um, understanding about definitions, what is genetic, marine genetic resources, both from an ecological, economic, and cultural understanding of that. Um, and, and again, I think the, 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 the real emphasis that we need long, sustained, genuine partnerships, uh, both financial partnerships to build capacity. I think Alfred also raised this quite importantly. Um, the need for these kinds of no parachute scientists flying in and then flying out again, but real sustained uh, partnerships across the Pacific. Um, Alfred's point around conservation is really this kind of enhanced cooperation because the ocean is one dynamic entity. Uh, it shouldn't be viewed as in it, it's separate. Um, and the Q&A I think has been really, really rich, really to understand the role of our development, developed partners in, in this part of the ocean, uh, particularly the role of Japan the world of France, the world of Australia and New Zealand, uh, the complexities of interest, competing interest in this part of the Pacific, and how do we continue the coordination and collaboration uh, in the Pacific. I think there's some big, big issues that still needs to be resolved. Um, to all of our uh, audience, um, we will ensure that the PowerPoints get to you, uh, there have been some outstanding questions as Maroni pointed out. Take takeaway, uh, as Calvin initially in his introduction pointed out, this is a start. We see that there's definitely a lot of interest in these kinds of information sharing capacity awareness raising. Um, and I think that can continue with the next webinar. But to all of our panelists, thank you again, echoing uh, Maroni's um, initial welcome and thank you to all of you. Uh, really respect your time, uh, your knowledge and your ability to bring that knowledge on our first deep dive into BBNJ. So thank you very much, lots of work to do.
uh, obviously lots of complex issues to think about uh, overlapping governance, um, regional, national, and international. And I think we have to really prioritize what is our role uh, as the custodians and stewards of the largest ocean in terms of protection. Uh, when we think about this in, term, in, in an intergenerational uh, perspective. So once again, on behalf of Dawn, um, WWF Pacific, uh, the High Seas Alliance and PANG, uh, a very big thank you to you all. Naka. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Yeah. And I've got...